So my name is Dr. Corey Gilbert, and I'm a professor at Corbin University in Salem, Oregon. So honored to be here and have you guys here. Um, throughout the whole presentation, there's a QR code to give the handout and other videos about the presentation if you're interested. So we'll start there. Um, when I went to college, I went to college uh, as a music major. My heart and passion was to go into music to be a musician. I grew up in South America, I was a kid, and I wanted to go back home. My junior year of college, my professor sat me down and said, um, you're not graduating. Oh. You have that talent. No oh! Oh! It was the end of my world. Oh! But it made me an opening for one elective. And so that one elective, I took a counseling class. Oh! Because God knows. He knows. What's funny is during that season, uh, during that season with being a music major, uh, I had to sing songs in front of my professors. So I would get up in front of my professors and they would pick my song from my repertoire and I'd sing it. Well, there was this one song in English that had the word breasts in it. <laughs> I can't say that in front of my professors. That's, that's a bad word. No! So I'm going along my ways. I, yeah, I did. He cut me off right before the word and had the same in front of professors, gave me one of But within two years, I was in a seminary studying counseling, and my whole world has changed. I've been in practice for 23 years, been a professor for 19 years, married to my amazing wife for 20 years, uh, and God's incredible. Yes. God's yes. incredible. So, two of my kids, two of my boys, Blaze and Alex, this is a number of years ago, 2018. We went skiing. We lived in Salem, Oregon. We're an hour and a half from the Cascades. Go, it's amazing snow. And so we were up there. It was the last day of the season in April. Uh, it was hot. So we were like shedding uh, layers. Well, there was this girl there, a number of young ladies, wearing uh, sports bras. My middle son, one of them going, Why is she wearing that? Yeah. Yeah. And the guy next to her goes, Because she's hot. And he was confused. <laughs> Which one? <problem? laughs> so that was okay, we moved on. And then a few hours later, this young lady came flying past his paws. No. Yes. I went home. Luckily, Blaze, my little guy, was not there. He would have had a hated battle. Oh. He's, he's our one hand. Oh. But Alex chased after him and got to where he was at. And he was just mortified. Oh. I'm like, first time? Oh, he's like, yes. Oh. We got some talking to you. We talked about this this moment. Hundreds, perhaps a few hundred times. Why? You start realizing in these moments there's some things you've talked about and there's some things you haven't talked about. Like that young lady, the different ladies were wearing sports bras. Is that okay or not? It's like it's none of your business, Paul. Why do you teach that to your kid? It's not your call. But he was curious, also a homeschool kid, but. <laughs> Later on, about a month or so later, I took my three kids to see the Ready Player One. Didn't really know what to expect. And there's a scene in there that was not comfortable as a dad to the next one of my kids. And it was a scene right here with the virtual world, and they, this young lady comes out in this really tight dress. And so I'm like, oh gosh, we've got some fun conversation to come with. So later on, we're driving home, and I'm like, I'll explain my life. So they're like 13, 10, and 8, or something like that. So I said, So what was your How'd you like the movie? And Alex was mortified. Because he was like, Aware, more aware, and that was kind of uncomfortable. My middle son was like, focused on the end of the movie where the guy gets kicked in the crotch. And he was like, and he thought that was the most hilarious thing in the world. And my daughter was like, And we had conversations about that, about the, the relationships and boundaries, and then what are we watching TV, what are we watching on, on movies, what are the boundaries of that kind of stuff. And so what's happened is I have three experiments. Yeah. You were experienced, by the way, so yes, I. I have three. They're my test subjects. Yeah. They're now 17, 15, and 13. Uh, so they're still good. Yeah. Are, are we ever going to feel like in this journey from music major, missionary kid, 
to what I'm doing now. Um, the area of sexuality was something that was not taught to me. I didn't understand. Scared of until I started seeing clients. And then realizing that I have to go there. It led from that to training in trauma and training in lots of other areas. I feel like I take more classes now, in the years of doing this, than I did when we started. Constantly growing, constantly trying to be just a little, a little more to help somebody in some tool that I may not be aware of. And so the area that I want to focus on today is sex ed for our kiddos. This is not the job of the school. This is really not the job of the church. Although we have lots of ways we can do this better. This is the job of the parents. And so I want to teach and talk to kind of what we can do. So these appropriate conversations for us with kids, but then also some examples of you know, some things that I've done with other groups and with other people. So one of the things that I want us to think about is learning about basic human sexuality. There are classes you can take, there are things you can do, there are trainings you can do to just get the basics. The book I wrote, you can't say that, that's what I did. It's for parents, help them tra train themselves, walk through themselves, what does the scripture say about a biblical worldview on gender sexuality? Don't care what you think, I don't care what I think, what the Bible says. I think that's where we get stuck a lot of times. But how can I become a confident parent? This is not an area we tend to have confidence in. We actually get stuck in our own story, our own wounds, our own inability to say the word breasts, or penis, or anything else. We get stuck there. And the honest truth is, is going to confidence is going to come through knowledge. It's all that's why we're out here. That's why we're here. It's confident and um, to knowledge and understanding of that. So what are some key areas? A theology of sex. What does the Bible say about sex? Not our experiences, not even our hurts. What does scripture say? The brain of sex. There's really cool research from brain and brain imaging, the brain of love on the effect of healthy sexual sex life. Do you, do you know what's going to refer to that? Talk about that. Is there you have resources for that? And really important tied to that is the theology of marriage. I live in Oregon, and what's being pushed there is polyamory and throuples and all sorts of stuff. I had a guy recently said that the, the norm in the schools around us, our kids don't go to the schools, but the norm is our kids have a throuple in our kids, or our parents have kids here, their parents do. It's really interesting and sad as we're trying to reinvent marriage because marriage is just a social construct unless you open the Bible. And the truth is, either I do or someone else does. A number of years ago, uh, California announced that you need to teach all 15 genders to kindergartners. I remember going, just 15? There's like 90 something on Facebook, so what about the other ones? And Facebook's down there, so I'm going to be on not that I can tell you what any of them mean. Um, what I've heard from the parents is this. Oh, I can't help my kids. But you're going to send your kids to the school and let them talk. So, who's going to be first? And this is very anecdotal to me. What I've seen, our kids can be when they think first. We must go there. So the idea of going beyond the top, the top starts at zero. One, two, three, four, not fifteen. You're going to learn a lot from your teenagers, by the way, if you start at fifteen. You'll learn a whole lot about the world you didn't want to know about. And so one of the terms that I kind of started using is this one, micro-conversations. But what I realize it is, when you get older, is it, it isn't micro-conversations. It's actually kind of like many lectures. Not like for lectures, I have that word. It's a little bit sermon, but what it is is it's actually seeds planted. Our job is to plant seeds. So I've had students that have done research with me, um, and what they have found following my human sexuality class I've been talking about for about 10 years, and then the gap that we have is parents say this Oh, but I've told my kids that I'm safe and I'm coming with anything, they haven't come with me. So it's up to the kid to come, the team to come. No, let's not put it the ball in their court. Let's be the one to go there, which means we have a lot to work on. The not being comfortable with is definitely an issue. So let me start with zero to five. 
this the term that I kind of use, or the thing that I kind of define as that is pretty too early. Most of us don't think this way, that we should keep talking about this. I had a booth a couple of years ago at a homeschool conference. And I remember sitting there with my books at this booth, and just long after long walking by, and I didn't get a glance to the elder or baby or toddlers. Why? Because I'll think about that when my kids teenage them. Like, again, you'll learn a lot from them. Let's start soon. Let's start early. So, where do we start with our kids? We start with the basic family. The words we teach them are important. Part of this is we need to correct body parts. We need to use these words, and here's the reason. To me, this is so important, the reason. To prepare them so that there's something wrong, to have the language to use. So think about it that way. I want to teach them the right thing. My daughter one time stood up, and she grabbed herself down here and goes, my bottom hurts. That's not the bottom. Where did you get this term? And my wife actually went, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> call the vulva. It may not be a sexy word, but that's what it's called. Call it. It's not a giant either. So use the right word, and then it helps us when it comes to actually conversations with our kids as they're growing up, and if they actually might have problems or, God forbid, it just happens, someone touches them at some point. Which is what it is all of those we talk. They don't come to us. So one of the habits that we had as our kids were younger was when we had babysitters, we had lots of babysitters. Um, I'm a professor and I have three babysitters. Who cares? <laughs> lots of babysitters. But when we came home, and I would say this in my classes to my students too, we would come home and ask our kids, as you did way every day, you change your diaper, did anything weird. I wasn't looking for them to tell me the truth. I was looking for them to tell me some, some different how they can answer a pause. If a shame enters the picture, it shuts us down. And, what was, and I was saying this to them, like asking them, but I was also saying this in my classes so, so that these young ladies knew that I was doing this. It wasn't like something covert, it was very covert. Because it's important to protect. Now, one time I didn't come home with my. Uh, babysitters, just a little Lola. Um, she had a picture, she had deleted the picture, and my son had stolen her phone and taken a picture of himself. He was, he was a little, a little tired. So, she was so embarrassed, but she was amazing. She deleted it and said, I'm supposed to have your call. You can call him, we'll deal with him. <laughs> so, with him. Um, things happen, and I can deal with it. But as we know, when it comes to trauma, it's actually abuse. Use is not just because you're doing your stuff. It's someone down the street from me, it's someone I know, it's someone in my circle, it's someone in my family, it's someone I've vetted. We have to not be hyper aware of, but be aware of. So, this is why the language is really important. Another big one is this one being sure not to stereotype what a boy or girl, but emphasize that you are a boy or a girl. It's weird to even have to say this, but it's important. Now more than ever, with the movements we have, and we'll talk about that more a little bit later, we need to emphasize and be educating them on this and emphasizing And if they're not stereotypical, yay, praise God for that. I am who I am because I'm not stereotypical. And I thank God for that. And then that you're loved by God and your family. Is this about sex? No. But this is about who they are. This is about the theology of marriage. This is about the whole piece of helping them develop. And that's why this is really important. <coughs> Recognizing that brothers, sisters, parents, friends, bodies are different. Helping them see that actually God made you fearfully, wonderfully made. And I have a son, by the way, who, when he was born, he had a microphone. And I had to go to Shriners in Greenville, South Carolina, and have her moved. And I remember sitting in Shriners and go, and just weeds just falling. And I looked at my son, who was there for an extra thumb, what to do. And watched some of the families that were there were severely handicapped, mentally and physically, children. Some are dealing with so much more difficult and seemingly impossible lives as we all. And know what the best way to be so to see. Begin teaching about appropriate touch towards and from others. This is where it starts. It's not starting out with it. It starts when they're zero to five. 
This is so, so important. And this stage marked by curiosity and exploration. Now, one of the things that we did when our kids were young was actually, we had these books on our shelves. The older version of the book. They look a lot prettier. But um, Jones and then this Good Picture Bad Pictures. Now, the Good Picture Bad Pictures, my son one day, because they're in their bookshelves, they're just there for them to think and grab and pick up. And if they asked a question, we go pick it up and read it to them and talk to it. And we did that a lot. They read this one, and one day my son was outside, very late, standing on the lawn, parked across the street, and he was kind of rocking back and forth. I was like, what are you doing? He's dead. My thinking brain, my feeling brain says that if I, that I want to go across the street with my thinking brain, I'm going to get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Huh. You're a neuroscientist, you're a neuroscientist. That simple, Some, somewhat, so amazing. To use these tools that people have developed to help teach and educate. There are a lot of great ones out there that are more being developed all the time. Now, let me move to this next stage, 6 to 10. To me, you think of that word "let talk" or the phrase "let talk." This is actually here. Part of what I teach parents is it's in the single digits. Much of what you do after they're in double digits is too late. It's not ever too late. Dot dot. But it gets harder. So think single digits. Um, so again, you know, the thing is the talk. Many of us have the talk. I remember driving down the road one day. My dad says. Son, have you heard of masturbation? I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I ask my sons about their practices in that area every few weeks. When I walk in the room, my middle son will go, no, I'm not looking the corner. If they're in the room, I'm with a laptop. Our, our conversations around the dinner table revolve around this, as in it's very normal, and it's something that we talk about. Normalize is to talk about laugh a little bit, but also create boundaries. This is where you're teaching about young men, how do you treat young women? Young women, how do you treat young men? In your head, your heart, your steward, fantasy, all these things starts here. Well, here are the areas. Here we get into the more scripture now. You start getting into more more graphic, more, more details. And one of the things that some of you might be thinking is, but they're too young for some of the conversations. Every kid's different, there's not like exact time frames here. What I have found is if my child is too young, they don't really know where to file it. So just kind of go back into the back drawer for a year until they have somewhere to hang. I'd rather be too early than too late in this area. So I want to go to it early, and I remember when I started by, I was like, okay, okay, just take off. It's like a dead lamb. But a few months later, something happened, and now they have someone to think, oh, that's what that means. That's what you're looking for. Well, you're actually staying ahead of the curve there. You talk about the word masturbation. Not once they are, before they start opening that door. I hope you don't open this door. I hope that this is something you don't get addicted to or hooked on. This book probably will, and so I want to help you steward this. So when I talk to my sons, when I ask them the question, now they are me teenagers. But it moves it out of unconscious into the conscious, and they now have to think about it after. We love stuff to wrap around back here in unconscious because we can instinctively not. It's not like we're responsible for it, which is the truth. We want to get it out of it and actually go, then you're a steward of how you manage the fantasy of some person you saw or something you saw online. And so that's really important. Sexual identity. That is the, that's, this is a key stage, six to ten. We're talking through and developing who they are. Me growing up, I wish we had had conversations about this. We didn't. We didn't. And I struggled and struggled and struggled. Because everything about me was not what everyone else, about like everyone else. I didn't understand them. So a lot of what I see teens and I see young people struggle with, I can relate to it very well in my own experience, but also no place to go. What I worry about today is it's like it's being crammed down your throat to almost everyone has to be. And so when you look at the data right now on those that identify as LGBTQIA+, it's, it's 24, 25% of Gen Zers. 
No. Yes. So we do. We have a lot of young people, actually I would say it's 100 percent of young people who are trying to figure out who they are. It doesn't necessarily start when they're a teen, it starts way earlier. So, we, so what are we doing in the state? We're planting the seeds. What is it about dignity and modesty? You may not agree with this, but when my daughter got this huge bag of clothes in the mail from her man, she was little, 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 and my wife looked at me one day and she was going through it and was like, hey, here's a sports bra. Is this underclothes or outer clothes for our little tiny girl? It's like, well, it's underclothes. So we established uh, how our family was going to do this. Does everyone else do that? No. What's the first thing my sister, my middle sister did when she got to college, went out buying jeans, you know, that kind of thing? We all have our trauma from that. This is what you teach about that. And again, young men, you steward yourself, you steward your eyes, you steward your heart, you steward your behavior, and you're a protector. You know, that seems to be very, very cool these days. I want to raise my son to do that. And then my daughter, to have that wherewithal, that being through what's to do in a while. Pornography. I wish our kids were just looking at naked pictures. They're not. You don't know that. They're not. They're skipping that. It's straight to graphic video, void of intimacy, and that will forever rewire their brain, or they will not be able to if they're not careful to experience true intimacy. It hijacks. Praise God when there's, when we get that up, when there's a time when we actually can, again, fix our brain, we can heal our brain. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Dr. Amy talks about We need to talk about this early. That's the good picture, bad picture, is kind of conversation. How do you steward that? And then when it comes up, do you shame them? Do you yell? Do you scream? Do you have conversations? A young lady, a friend of mine, she came in and her daughter had slammed a lot of clothes and she told me about her She went and yelled and screamed at her daughter a hundred times worse because her husband has a history of this problem. So later we were talking and it's like, when she finally talked to her daughter, her daughter had just come home from school and typed in pregnancy. She was curious about pregnancy, but two clicks later, she saw what she didn't want to be. And the fact is, it's, it's too easy. So it's talk to it ahead of time, not wonder how they got there. They're, 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 even if you have a walk down house, they're going to get there on a friend's phone, or a grandma white hat, or one guy off uh, in the white. You threw it. Nintendo DS, you name it, they're going to find it. Sin finds its way. Now, what about parents? What dream is cracked? Too many young ladies I talk to, this is the most traumatic season of their life. Let's prepare them, let's talk through this. How? My son and daughter walk into my bedroom, my wife's in the bathroom, and they ask, What's going on? Well, I'm going to create. This is what it is. Normalize. Miley, you're going to be dealing with this one day. Big white eyes. But the first time, not now. It's not a big white eyes reaction now because she's been prepared for what will come. Not this horrible, evil demon is coming. That may be what you're going to experience. So, not that I have to do that. Gender. This is a new word in a sense. We need to talk about gender. It has been hijacked and removed from sex. It's different. It really isn't in some ways, but it really is. Because it's actually the article that all me and I hear myself better. So I'll talk about that here in a minute as well. Sexual reproduction. Um, one time at the dinner table, we were sitting in the ground and my kids were and I were talking about something, and all of a sudden Miley goes, penis? Vagina? No. <laughs> and we all busted out laughing. Because she had learned and heard and learned and heard, she's the youngest, and she all of a sudden she kind of you find it, put it all together. <laughs> She's there. Was it traumatic? No. It's very different when actually a lot of boys and girls that I hear, the first time I saw pornography, it tends to be very traumatic. There's also been something that's late in the especially in the darkness, especially in secrecy. Satan had to hide it. We normalize that it's there, this is not healthy for you. Nudity is good. 
we're protecting from some of these minefields that actually come up. And the first reality is that you set the stone by the seven. Again, we think of the top 13, 15, whatever. I want to have a conversation with the plant to see this prior to the age of seven, honestly. And many of you, you think of your seven-year-old and you go, no. Yes. And it depends on where they're at, it depends on who they're in around. Our kids are homeschooled. Like, they fight with each other and us. <laughs> and we do a lot of stuff. It's great. It's very different if your kids in a different school system or even in a certain co-ops. Or here's the worst one. There, there's humans there. Oh no! And cousins. Don't let them be your own cousins. I guess just lock them in the basement. Or not. Maybe not. We need to prepare them. We're preparing them for a future to launch, actually, too, because of, that's where we want to flood them. Another one is off subject. <laughs> this is another one boyfriend and girlfriend. We don't talk about boyfriend and girlfriend at 13. They already have their friends, they know it all. You should sit there and they learn. <laughs> so we start talking about what are the rules of power coming in? I tell my kid, you can start dating your junior or senior year of college. Why? So you can put a ring on it, you can follow through. We don't play around before that. Has that played out that way? No. <laughs> Boy, if I struggle with both of my teenage boys. Um, as they really have liked girls and what boundaries and it's been fun and it's been hot. One likes to keep secrets and one will wear his groceries on his sleeves. And again, we're experiments and they're all different. When we start planting the seeds, what does it mean to get, what does it mean to build that relationship? Again, think of it, we're talking 16 years old. We're not talking 15 years old. Because they're listening to their friends who are allowed to date when they're 13 or 16 or whatever. And I don't, I can't say this is research based, but what I say is you're, if you start dating in your teens, and I know Dr. Byrne and others have done some research on this, if you start dating in your teens, expect a baby or a wedding in two years. The hormones of what happens to me, I less than dating is the most ridiculous concept. Unless there are some boundaries and parameters put in place, and it can be an amazing experience at times. But you're preparing them to launch. This is the part about that. You want them to be attracted to the opposite sex, to want to form a family, to desire that as part of their story, to be a mother, to be a father, to be a husband and wife. And again, in that relation, we've got to keep kind of coming back to this conversation. This is probably the season when that's going to enter into the picture. For some reason, for some reason, just from experimenting and stuff on us, have the conversation. What does it mean to be a friend of others? Pornography, again, trauma and abuse, and it's really important that they are under authority. They are under authority. Ours right now, when you walk out of this door, you're under leases, you're under teacher, you're under your freaking lessons, the piano lessons, that, that teacher, that anything, anyone, anywhere. And ultimately, you're in your We all have an ethic, we all have something that we follow. How prepare them to understand that the seeds are planted younger or not, we hope we can catch up to as we get older. Now, age 11 to 17, this is what we would actually say if we're heading into the top. This is what we're going into puberty, maybe marriage, gender, sexuality. These were my buddies just a few weeks ago. My Alex and Alex just finished a legal project. Um, and then my son got the love of luscious locks, red hair, <laughs> with protocol and with our homeschool group. Um, we have experiments. They're so different. It's incredible to see the difference. And I hope you see that in your own children and your clients and your parishioners. That we're all so different until we celebrate that. This stage, this adolescent stage, for some, is an absolute nightmare. For some families, it doesn't have to be. This is a time to be, to be building an alliance with them. Some of the ways I've done this, I'm not saying this is right, but I looked at my son, I remember when he turned about 13 or something, it's like, this kid's going to be an amazing year, but I'm not going to Why? We're not friends. 
but it's amazing to grow into a friend in a certain way and enjoy things. Or certain traumatic times. When a friend got sent off to a treatment center and he might go and my older boy ran away. I go find him. He's out somewhere in the community. He's hurting, he's grieving, he didn't get to say goodbye. This is a struggle of identity. It's so much more than just sexual. Who am I? Hopefully, the question of where's God calling me? A lot of what I see when we do with adolescents in many settings is what do you want to do when you grow up? And I almost kind of want to say, I don't care what you want to do. Where is God calling you? It's kind of my favorite stories of these men and women who had an incredible gift in this direction, and God says, I want you there. My father in law just celebrated 50 years of pastoral ministry at three churches. And when he came to Christ at Barry College, met my mother in law, got married, he stutters like crazy. His major was like industrial arts, his desire was to hide. And he can fix anything, he can do anything, he's awesome, he's been an incredible pastor. And he's spoken for the 50 years. So beautiful. Help our sons and our daughters find their place is really, really important. That they are really wonderfully made. That as a believer, your body is a temple. So your choices actually do matter. Taking care of yourself does matter. As this is the season where the eating disorders and comparisons grow more that have to be considered. Part of the path they added some of the pictures they did a number of years ago because of girls attempting suicide on Instagram. It's probably why that kind of came on the scene. We know this is not okay. Yet, how many of us have to set boundaries with some of this stuff for the kids? That every other sin you commit is outside your body. There's something about the sexual. You have to define that well for them to help them understand that you're not a mistake, not trapped in the wrong body, and you can have a unique personality. So you might be a boy that's very feminine, a girl that's very um, tomboyish as the world used to be, but wonderful, beautiful, amazing. How do we help celebrate that as we raise them versus try to make them be what I basically do my mind, which is really, really difficult. It's often my desire. Getting an understanding of sexual reproduction. Getting to understand. That actually, and this may be revolutionary for everyone here, but every time a penis goes into a vagina, it's meant to make a baby. By design. It's meant to. No, God, it doesn't. If you do the math on that, you have a lot of kids. By design, it's meant to make a baby. We've actually done a lot of a good job of emphasizing the pleasure. We're not careful to get there. It's meant to make a baby. It's meant to. God's perfect design. Teach that. And so an adolescent who had sex and surprised her pregnant is kind of confusing. But yes, I have met the young lady who doesn't understand what sex is. And I've met the young lady I've sat with them who look, they don't know how they got there because they were never there. Or I have three or four STDs and I don't even know what sex is. We may not think that's true. That's true today. How many grow up in a home where they were not given any kind of attitude? Any kind of attitude they can. They need us. So we need to refrain from sexual immorality. It's important who your idols are, who influences you. I mean, it's concerning to me to see how we look up to stars and athletes and some of these other. Like, it really concerns me. It is worship. Ah, that, that's what that bugs me. What do you do with that? How do you teach them? And back when I was a kid, I would have pictures of you know, the big posters on the wall and stuff like that. I remember walking into my sister's dorm room when we were kind of moving her out. She had a picture of Fabio on the wall. I'm like, why is that okay? <laughs> we have a lot of those pictures and stuff like that. Now, this is marked by experimentation and identity. Trying to figure out who I am. I'm further defining the boundaries I'm dating and courting. Again, I'm going to get a conversation about pornography. What about social media? 
When am I old enough to have social media? It's probably when some of you are not old enough to have social media. <laughs> it's an area of stewardship. Because up there are some 15 or 16 year olds that are very much able to manage having a car and be respectful of the boundary. My oldest son is this 93 Jeep. We love Life 360 because it sends you a message every time he arrives somewhere of how fast he went. <laughs> and anytime he goes over any post that's in our area, my wife goes, and pays me five bucks out of the account. That's our new way of managing his 80 plus speed car. Uh, uh, how do you treat others? How are you treating others that are different? What does the Bible say, not mom and dad? Or social media? Where are they getting their truth from? Really, really important. This is a time of deepening your identity. Are you kind, respectful? What is your work ethic? We have a problem with a work ethic. Crisis of war right now. Businesses can't stay open because they can't find workers. I've really enjoyed the last few days having prayer prayer in your life. Because all the prayer prayers in Oregon were just awesome. <laughs> Couldn't find employees. Probably a cultural issue against that company. But how do we love and walk alongside and be in a relationship with people? Maybe boys and girls, men and women, friends of mine are different. We're teaching this by our attitude. If we're sarcastic and we're actually evil or mean or condescending or cut down, surprise, surprise, we probably will. Or they're really good to be off the rock because you're the most unloving person. How we talk really matters. If I've done this perfect, it was great. I could speak for a few hours on my failure there and then the cleaning up you have to do with your kids. We need to lead them well to love people that are different in any way, shape, or form. Beware of the decisions that can't be unmade. There's some decisions being made right now that cannot be unmade. That devil is after me. Certain kinds of forms, certain amounts, the things that does your body and can be devastation will pop up at you also. Maintain integrity and conviction in what God is saying. Can I make my son or daughter believe in God, follow God, and live in Christ's life? No, we know that. We want to believe that. So a lot of times what we do is we try harder. Which ironically becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy pushing them further away. It's like when a friend of mine was dating a girl who he knew was bad news. What do you do? Well, convince him that she's bad news, right? Good luck with that. She's, he's going to try to convince you why he's right and you're wrong. Versus going, wow, this is so exciting that I love your life. Oh, and she has a child. We're going to be a dad. Just like that. I'm so excited for you. I hope you guys have a big life. I fast forward for five, two years, and you're going to have this, and you're going to. And all of a sudden, you see their eyes are bigger and bigger. And you kind of paint the picture in the future. And you go home and break up with her. <laughs> I tell my counseling skills class, it's called the other subtitle of classes, the art of manipulation. <laughs> kind of kidding, but kind of not. Why? It's why you and I need to be careful. It scares me, well, it scares me to be a fear, but it scares me to be in the place of influence sitting with a client, knowing that you're affecting generations. Not just the people in front of you, generations just from one appointment. I think some of you have one more appointments. You are affecting a lot of people. So that needs to weigh on you. It weighs on me every single day. Sometimes I'm going to tears of the, the awesomeness of what that, that influence is. Now, this is a sad picture because it's too true. What do we do with the way our world has changed? We can't function without these devices. I remember where I was standing when I, the iPod Touch came out. The most amazing invention on the planet. I can't believe it. A computer in your hands that can do all these things until social media can go. Um, this is a great tool that is actually being misused left and right. I call these, I, what I call smartphones, the phone board. 
Porn portal. Yes, porn portal. What do you do? Open your phone up. Click on Safari. Open Google. P O R N. And then protect your mind. So what comes up on the list of Google? A list of questions, a list of websites. Porn hub and the like. They're text based right now. When you click on images or videos, you're like never the same. That's how close. And how many of us are working with adult men and women who can handle that? How much more so do we need to be really careful about the boundaries around that with our children? Does that mean those cell phones? No. There are a lot of really good tools out there. There are a lot of great kinds of phones and other kind of devices and things like that. Wonderful. Try them. Some are great, some are annoying. We've tried to watch them. But it's also about your son or your daughter and helping them steward. Because one day they're going to walk out of your house. What I've seen with some of the families that are dealing with some of the most drama is they raised their kids well, they had a great home, they went to church every time the doors were open. But why did they go a different direction than mom and dad? And I found they looked at their online friends. Because what they're doing online, down the hall from you, or right there in the living room, or in their bedroom, which is probably where they go. And the relationships they're building online with people they don't know is having the most influence on them in the future. This is a big deal. So what's stunting their kids' growth? Number one, and these are not in order, but one of the first ones I'm going to put up here is porn. It's not, our world is not the same because of what that's become. It's a crisis. It's too easily accessible and it's dangerous to change it every day. It messes with marriages. It, we know that. We know that. Another one, though, is it's a sex and video games, right? Video games are not the usual parts when I choose to do that over real human interaction in person. When I choose to play for hours on end with a backdrop, or I can't get myself to go to work because I'm so obsessed. This is my world. That's when we got a problem. Another one is absent fathers. Even a dad is there, but not really. The relationship with dad is so critical. It's scary to me with my boy. And I look back at a decision I made 12 years ago and I still laugh. I never did a Boy Scouts. My dad was a Eagle Scout. We lived in South America. We didn't have it, so I didn't do any stuff. But when my oldest got in first grade, he was doing the starting line. Now he's an Eagle Scout. And I walked along the side as a scout leader. And what he's done is he's carved out some time that I know every month I'm going to my camp out. And every summer I went along. Not so good. There's times I'm going to camp out, even a week long, that I'll have maybe one conversation with my son. It's not about me having conversations, it's about me being there, knowing that I'm there. And every kid's different. Even my two experiments, boys, are very different as to what they need from me. We need dads. If you don't have a dad, you need a surrogate dad. That's why I do Boy Scouts. I think we need dads and we need boys. Some who don't. But guess what? Those other men in our community are ours are just dads. The other dads are loving on house. It's a setup. It's a setup to actually have them, have people they can go to that I kind of beg in that they can trust. Right now my wife's traveling, I'm traveling, and we have two kids at home alone. Where are they at? One of our boys got family's house. Because of the relationships and what happened in the past. We were watching our daughters watch them. In other words, you're We see it everywhere. It's really heartbreaking how the, the role of res- being responsible, what does that mean, work out the day? But that ties into this other one, skillless. We were doing a road trip this summer, and uh, my boys had known this for a long time. But my daughter started helping with the summer. She helped change the oil and everything. And so, since then, she's like, Mom, I need to check the oil in your car. Mom, I need to check the oil in your car. <laughs> she's adorable. I think my car that I need to get fast. So, 
you need to learn these skills. When my kids growing up, I had a house built in 1893, I would restore it. I had to put plumbing, electrical, everything. Drywall, that's enough. Never could have done it. But it was one of those things where I'm teaching them along the way. Everything from fixing the cars, the things around the house, the skills are critical. And then something you need. I wonder to remind you too, so the cards that are on the seats, there's cards around these, I didn't have enough um, that they're around there. Write down the code AACZ2023, remember that, sure. But even on the two R codes on here, you click on the other link, goes to this. These are videos that I made in different topics. They're just short little moment, teaching moments of how do you talk about this, how do you talk about that, and I'm constantly adding to it. And that's why that's there. So you don't get caught. Just write down the ACC 2023. I want to show you something that I've been reading this summer. Um, I've been reading a lot of books this summer that came out this summer. It's been really interesting this summer. I'm only on going backwards with this summer with a few more things that have been coming out there. This is one of the books for the Lost in Translation. This to me is a book that is an absolute must read. Um, this is Dr. Grossman. She actually says that she believes she'll lose her license over publishing this book. Um, but she's like, I'm in my 70s, so bring it on. <laughs> Love her. She's amazing. And then Jordan Peter, she writes the forward in the 80s. Not nice, let's just say it's awesome. Um, so I want to show you a few pieces of this. Because again, if you don't, someone else will. So what, what is it she's kind of warning us? About in this book. It's really kind of an expose. Um, a reality today is going on. Teachers make claims that if parents are not 100% affirming, they are the child's parent. This is becoming a reality. This is not becoming is a reality in lots of schools across our country. And what do you do with that? If you combat this, you are put in the category of someone that actually is going to have CPS at your door. And some of those things too. Another one, counselors. Can you can your local counselors be trusted when you come from the local world view? I worry about this one personally. That are we truly standing on a local world view when it comes to gender and sexuality? Or are we just afraid of realizing it? My personal stance is bringing on in terms of losing the license. And it will happen for many of us, maybe. Or maybe the child time will change and some of the legal stuff that's happening. We need to be praying for that desperately because some things are at the Supreme Court level that affect every single one of us. But are you going to stand on biblical truth or are you going to cave? And that, I'm, I wrestle with that. And I've had grieving conversations with different people about this. Um, but for some of us, if we haven't studied this much, we think what's going on in our culture just kind of all of a sudden happened a few years ago. No, 1950s, John Lennon, Alfred Kinsey, critical shakers of the world on false data, go do the study, it's horrifying. Claims that were made, things that are being said today that are not true based on studies that actually were utter failures. And that's where gender identity and main things are actually coming from. This has been a slow process. It's actually it should scare us. Are you staying up to date and studying? You can't study everything. You can't. That's the power of the ACC. You have to these things to learn and grow. How to get a fire hose. Um, but are you? Professional organizations. And what she goes through, Dr. Grossman, is all the, all the medical ones, the pediatric ones, all the ones kind of under her as psychiatry. That are basically the same, you know, you can't do this, but you can't do that. So she talked about the Castro consensus. What is it? Learn from Fidel Castro. We do it our way, we're out. That's what's happening. And I don't know what to do sometimes. Is it worth the fight? I think it is, but it's a question we need to ask. Legal, on the legal side, your child is not a miniature adult. We know this just from brain research. If they are not capable of making decisions of meaning, especially life-altering decisions, like chopping body parts off, 
Follow me. Yeah, that's the norm now. What do we do with that? We need to wrestle with that. And this is one that actually, this is a tough one. This is one that kind of challenged me to, to pause even in another area. The area of social transition. So she makes the claim. So the harmless allowance of social transi transitioning is the gateway drug to the on the assembly line. That when a kid gets put on that assembly line, 90 plus percent of them go from social transition to the to the hormones, to some surgeries, not, not all of them go that far. But they're on this trajectory. Yet the research shows that those that do nothing, that there's anywhere between 80% and 90 percent choose to be the birth sex, their birth sex. It resolves itself in a sense. In terms of that aspect of their story, they have now to the other parts of their life. What do we do with that? Because a lot of us in our loving someone as we go along with the social transitioning, it feels loving. When the results are almost she points that out. The idea of academic persistence. So they do unintentionally by attention or surgery to allow some people to have to do. What do we have? We have a lifelong client teaching on medicine, on drugs for life. Based off a need they didn't have before, but now they have a need and they have a need for the rest of their life. We created a vision. How about you? That concerns me. That concerns me in the counseling world as well. Do I see you every week because I need a paycheck? I think we need to check ourselves and go back to Walmart and get a job or something. <laughs> like, we need to be careful about that. Or CPS. The idea of rehoming your child is a possibility. This is happening in Oregon, like, for lots of people I know, friends I know, clients I know. Or CPS is involved, and they're saying you are actually no longer a safe parent, and so we're going to put your child in another one. And this is a affirming moment. It's happening in our, in our world. They get, they get hit away, which makes us make decisions around them. Actually, I think it tests our faith like crazy. God, can I believe that you're still God, even if my child is today? Or even if they do transition, or even if they do claim anything. In the end, and this is to me the most important piece, in the end, they can do whatever they want to their body and they can make a really bad choice in their whole life. How they surrender their life to Christ before they die. I'm not going to be with them in heaven just for now. We look at the finite, we look at the now. It's a much bigger story that's going on as to what we're fighting against. But the area that I spend my work on mostly is marriages. What I see is when this drama is going on at home, husband and wife are hanging on. The marriage is not okay. Why? Usually because they both are different and they both are family and so So I want to come alongside and say that your marriage is number one, actually. Love your normal marriage. Protect your marriage. Guard your marriage. Don't let Satan have another hold Resources like this, and I'm trying to read books, sex, Secrets of Sex and Marriage, came out this year as well. Another one with just the, the research in it, and the tools in it, and the simplicity yet practical do this, do this, grow here, action steps, I love this. Uh, it came out in February, I've been using it with all my clients, my students, you know, have to all study it, read it, I love it. These kind of tools are critical. Walk alongside the couple, we put them on the couple. Secondary might be some of the other pieces. How about this one? There's my daughter. There's my daughter. 20 years ago. So we do. Marriage is critical. And our actions as a couple are actually teaching our kids about the theology of marriage. It's also good to add some words to it. They're watching our actions. It's teaching them well, they're watching everything. Taking it in, every mistake, every peeping, or even secrecy, language hijack, euphemisms, zero percent regret rate, meaning we haven't done any studies on it. 
We don't keep data on those that require their transitioning, which makes it be able to say there's a 0% regression. That's some of the clinics that we do. Top surgery. No, it's not. It's called a double mastectomy. And Dr. Grossman talks about, which by the way, I've had, because of cancer. Because something was wrong and I had this done to me. And yet we're doing this it's perfectly healthy. But there's always a binding. Oh, go do some study on that. No, this is not just something that's harmless. This is doing lifelong damage to the breast tissue. This is not okay. And a lot of parents have no idea. Or a photo vagina or penis. You know what that's called? It's called a wound. When you take an alley and make it an innie, a faux vagina, you have to use dilators consistently and constantly trying to keep that open and open. It's a wound in your body saying, no, 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 close it, close it. It's heartbreaking what's happening to try to find these things. Well, here's a really scary one. Trans goal, new low is to do. What's a new low? The unit. Going in to have surgery, you just remove all aspects of the genitals and just be flat and it's nothing. And I'm leaving. What well, doctors have to do it? Why? Because that's the world we're living in. I don't know about you, like, that, it breaks my heart as to what we're dealing with and what's happening in our culture. It's evil. With the suicide data, it's often quoted as a myth. Yes, suicide is higher among those that are LGBTQI. But those that are trans, it's not the final transition, there's going to be a spike in suicide. That's actually not true. There's no data to prove it, which is why Sweden and all the other countries have said, you know what? We're going to put a problem with this and that. But yet, their research is showing there's a spike in seven years of post surgery. And they start going, oh, this isn't good anymore. It's scary. We need so much more research and so much more data to actually know what to do with this. Heartbreaking. I'm going to show you kind of what I do with this in terms of this. I'm thinking middle school. I was asked to teach um, for a middle school youth group on this, and you can see the whole thing on my YouTube channel. I have the whole, I don't have time to go through it all. But, um, created order, disorder, and what do you do? So I'm asked to come speak, and you know, I can come and talk about all these things, even the stuff we talked about today, some different things, different topics that we talked about. And instead, at the last minute, I kind of just scratched it all. I said, where do we need to start? Scripture. Man. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Work. Did you know work was prior to the fall? If you don't think that, but it is. The Lord God took the man to put him in the garden of Eden to work and take care of it. This is a beautiful part of who we are. I hope you love what you do even if it makes you exhausted. Work is a beautiful part of who you are. From the design, from the creative order. Woman, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will help make a helper suitable for him. And God created woman. Marriage. That is why a man needs his father and mother. He's united to his wife and they become one flesh. These are, by the way, two sexually different people. Adam and Eve and his wife were both naked. They felt you know, shame, something that we will never truly experience as fallen creatures. We didn't know the truth about that. And so there's a bunch of other scriptures I added. I took some out, and there's a few. And I walked through this with these middle schoolers. And then some more of what I want to show you in a second. And then they broke up into small groups, and my the youth pastor was like, we have never had this much discussion. And then they said, the number of comments from the youth were, I love it, he didn't give us just his opinion, but he put up the scripture. This is where we need to start. What does God's word say in terms of design? Now, another book that I'm going to throw up there that I've read this summer and I'm using with my students is this one. The Bible supports same-sex marriage. 
did a really good job of going looking at only like reasons that some say, yes, it does, and refutes each one of those with scripture, with scripture, with scripture. Why is this important to me? I teach a marriage class, and I'm trying to one of my students at a Christian university. It's their theology is you do you. Whatever makes you happy. Ah, oh, just stress me. One of the best um, course evaluation meetings I got from a young man in my US Atari class, he said, Thank you for pounding away at the theology of gender and sexuality. Because it's like you finally cracked through beliefs I thought I had and were firm. And I finally see what you're saying. And thank you for having patience with this. That was so frustrating that semester. You know, how long we see me like whatever goes and yet can be a Christian. So when you have this, then this happens. <laughs> now is our, our picture for the director of the church. <laughs> kind of sums our family up. Then they go up. <laughs> <laughs> do cool things with them. <laughs> Alex's hair was red at first, and then got more long. So we were actually dense. We were having our kids. <laughs> but my daughter was no longer red yet. It was darker. And it's right here, and now it's white. Part of this journey in scripture, and I skipped a bunch of scripture pages. Part of this next step in the creative order is to create these children. Procreation. It's meant to. Does it always happen? No. We know many that are really infertility. That's, that's not the point at this point. It's, it's meant to. It's the design. Beautiful. that concert. You can see it. all this summer. But then what happens? Disorder. What's disorder? Sin. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good, she disobeyed. What did it add to me? This is to be my favorite little piece. She disobeyed, but he's the one that got the command. What did he do? He went, the one you put here. And we started the blame game. And we're still doing it. We don't want to take it. Hey, we're not really for anything. You and I, if I'm careful, we're still doing this. Help, help, help our family. He, he failed as the helper here. Adam failed as the leader. Man will struggle with the return to the earth, and woman will just have pain and sorrow and struggle with him. Be part of a fallen world we live in. Which is why it's even more important than ever to have strong marriages, strong families, and every piece of data that's ever been done shows it and proves it that there seems to be a push in the path. I have students of mine in Salem, Oregon, that when they get engaged to someone, so they're going to be married to someone of the opposite sex, their friends from Portland disown them and go, Why would you sell for such an awkward thing? It's heartbreaking. Now, why is this important to me? I grew up in Michigan State in Temple Coche, um, moved to America by the time my senior year of high school. And let me show you just some pictures that might give you a little context. This was me in 1992 and 93. I love all Everything I owned was purple and pink. Everything I did was all, I had no clue what I was doing. And actually, I was on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic, and this missionary lady looked at me and goes, You've grown up in Chile, you're the white bear, you're standing like, like standing out like a sore thumb. Now you're in the United States, and you're a nobody, and you're trying to do everything you can to stand out. I didn't realize that. And then I went to college and needed music. I'm still wearing that pink coat. I didn't realize what I was saying. What does that mean? 
I fear that if I was living that age today, I don't know where I would be. Honestly, with you guys today, it just not Because there's some things I failed at, and the suicide attempts that I've had in, in college. I'm glad they were failures. I had a hard time dealing with culture, America, English, girls. Um, But along with this, for me, I mean, it's led to me who I am as a therapist, as a counselor, as a ministry, as a dad. You know when I finally made sense? And I met my bride. Because my wife is a former legal person. So she's got like a brain that actually, there was one day I was sitting outside having a crisis moment, ready to quit my job because of the whole COVID stupidity. And my wife comes and she starts going, well, you should do this. And I'm like, I'm crying. She's like, you just need to admit that you yes, need to fix it, male. <laughs> we joke, she's the guy, I'm a girl. Well, it makes sense, is, but at the end of the day, I'm still the guy, and she's still the girl, and the occupation is so perfect. And I see that. I help others see that. And then however you were made, you were fearfully and wonderfully made, even in all those media secrecies. This is me now. That's <laughs> what I write every day to work. It's great. Why? Actually, part of it was because of this weird kind of my male or non masculine, and so I grabbed onto this when I first came to America. The second reason was I spent my first year of marriage shopping for a motorized car, thinking I would be homebound. I walk up and get me crumbs. And doctors have said I've never had a job. Surgery, I know surgery, hospitalization, not just hospitalization, led to this hopelessness. I'm not going to why I say yes to marrying and marry me. And what's the answer to this? What's the antidote, if you will? You have creative order, you have disorder. What is the call for us? What I must do is surrender. Think about that invitation. Hey, I want you to come, but I want you to surrender. <laughs> Most of us wouldn't sign up. It's literally what Christ is calling us to do. Give up your rights. That's marriage. Give up you being first, you last. What is surrender? It's service. We marry someone because we think they're going to make us happy, and after the wedding, we realize. My job is to make them happy, serve them, make them happy. It's the exact opposite of why the call is not there. Why does the biblical, biblical sexual life matter? Romans 1 24 to 32. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires, their hearts to sexual impurity, to the degrade in their bodies. I don't know about you, this scares me. I can be given over. God can say, I love you so much that you can do whatever you need to do. I'm here waiting for you. That's to you, to me, to sons or daughters. And they may go make some really bad decisions. And our prayer is to be God, whatever you have to do to bring them back. It's a state of prayer. In exchange, we treated by God for a while, worshiped, and served, created things out of the creator, and his prayers to forever. Because this God gave them over. And here's the next part of it. Verse 32 Although they know God righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they do not only continue to do these great things, but they also approve of those who practice them. We are called to stand out. We don't like the way today in this culture, if we were to not do this, we would stand out. We need more men and women that will stand out and stand up and fight for our truth. It's messy. Absolutely messy. Where does it start? It starts at home. I kind of put it this way. So these three pieces of what I want to kind of build into my children. A vision, a code, and a cause. Vision of COVID and a cause. 
What's the vision? It's going to focus because of the nature of this topic. What is masculinity? What is femininity? What kind of standards I want my son or daughter to have to spouse? What are the sexual boundaries? I want them to know these things. Wouldn't it be amazing to go on a date, date someone, and not even have this pressure of, you know, where's the underwear? Did I shave my legs? Did I? We're not going to go there. Which is also amazing when you pursue someone the same, the like mind. The code is for Paul. We have rites of passages, we celebrate them. Significant past, logical consequences, grace to God. Are we preparing our young men to be adult men, and our young women to be adult women, to be leaders, to actually have an ethic to stand on something, to stand for something? But then this is what leads to the cause. Finding a cause to fight for How are you impacting or going to impact others for the better? This is what this is critical. What I followed that this passage of scripture with those adolescents, what I did after that. You want to guess what I did in the next slides after all those passages of scripture? More scripture. Walking into things like this. For your peer group, for your peer group, you anyway, when you get together in like, my uh, brother's world. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made you. Just lay the truth out there. Just lay it out there. Let God, and the Holy Spirit, do the work. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. We all have stuff for us When kids know mom and dad are real, it kind of changes how they see mom and dad actually for the better. But oftentimes we're trying to put up a fake front and the kids say, you know what, I can't be perfect like them because they can't. And by the way, I think it's not too. And when you follow your desires and your simple nature, the results are very clear. But, Again, learning the seeds. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in your lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. We can talk about these all the time. And it's also about how we're living, but we're planting seeds in our sons and daughters. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their simple nature to his cross. I have things I need to do. I'm actually preparing them and living out. Am I doing this? Some of the best moments is when your son or daughter says, you're not. Actually, I was actually teaching my new sexuality class years ago. My son was in the class. He was busy and he was sick that day. Homeschool family. He was there. I said something and my son raised his hand. He was like 10. Dad, you don't do that. <laughs> 50 students. They're all like, oh. <laughs> They all heard it from my own son. Yeah, they can. If you were to come to our house and sit down with them, they'll tell you my failures, my wife's failures. We talk about them a lot. Why? It's part of them growing and us growing because we're not done yet either. We have a self centered bent. We need Jesus. A book I read, another book I read this summer. I'll leave with this one. I painted a picture of a mom with her daughter standing in front of church and the elders and others praying over the daughter. She just starts to laugh. They're praying for healing over the daughter. She's like, the daughter has downs. Every cell in her body is not going to be healed on this side of heaven the way these people are praying. She just started laughing. Wouldn't that be weird? As she started realizing, we actually asked them after the wrong things. And so she wrote this book called To Be Made Well. What if within your bipolar, within your fill in the blank of any diagnosis, you were made well to the point that God desires to be made well? We all have limits, we all have limitations. We are created in God's image. But in a fallen world, 
I talk to my students all the time, we all have a mental health. Sometimes we talk about other people with mental health problems and all disorders. It's like, no, you won't ever want to do. Take an abnormal psych class and every week you're going to go, oh gosh, I have that too. And the next week I have that too. We all have our stuff. How am I surrendering that to Christ and realizing that, yeah, there's some areas that I have to stick for Hillary Clark? Now that's going to be harder because there's a big need that I have. Get the label. Let's find help. Let's find tools. But I also realize there's some limits there. And that, like, that's okay. And then she talks a lot about just the beauty of raising a daughter, journeying with a daughter, knowing that there's a limit for her. But is she made well? No, oh, she's made well. Can you be made well? That's all that Christ wants to do in our lives. But if we're not careful, we look around and go, I want that, I want that, I want to do that, I want to do that. And it's like, I've got you here. He wants to make this way. Because the scary thing is, you know, I hear someone else does. I want to be there before my son or daughter faces some hard questions or peer pressures that even I could have foreseen. I want to help them prepare the, the place that I started, so the way that I began this whole journey for me. Coming out of seminary and starting counseling was when I was introduced to Dr. Sykesman and Deborah Taylor and Doug Rosenau. Um, the the wholeness. This is where I was. I was single at the time. Actually, it was kind of going, God, wait a minute. I'm single doing marriage counseling and sex stuff, and I'm a single virgin. You have got to be kidding me. And what I was learning from ladies who was saying, just be faithful. Just be faithful. So this is an amazing journey. In fact, actually, 20, I was here at my first conference. It was 24 years ago, 1999. So if you're new, come back. I'm still coming. I love it. This is the most amazing time growing. I also really connecting with friends. I ran into so many of my students while I was here, which has been such a joy over the years. Yeah, we're glad you're here. Thank you so much. You are a very well this one. You can access a whole bunch of stuff. I put a video and other stuff for you. It's all there for you. My, my desire is to just serve you and help equip you as you be making a difference. Thank you.